So I'm a pediatric cardiologist, and I love that work. As the years went by, though, however, I started to feel that while working with a set of complex problems in a highly specialized population was incredibly rewarding in many ways, there was potential to do more. And so my own journey was how could we play in in my view, a role in improving health exponentially at much broader scale. And what I became interested in is the most powerful technology, which is the technology without wires. We often think in extremely complex ways, but I think a lot of the improvements in health at scale can be done in an analog way. Here I've demonstrated, uh, hand-drawn, um, what health looks like. There's a distribution of health, and the ideal world, all of us are working on innovations that move that distribution all the way to the right. Everybody's health improves, and everybody gets better. But in truth, most interventions, the impact looks something more like this, where the benefits are seen in a small group of people, the average health gets better, but the distribution actually increases. In other words, many advances help a small number of people, but at the cost of worsening the disparities across that entire group. This is the classic definition of population health, where we're interested not only in the average health, but also the distribution of health and those outcomes. That was a problem I wanted to work on. How can we improve health at scale, not for only a small number of people, but for entire populations, where my mantra became the denominator is everybody. Here's an example of how I started to think about this, and this is drawn a little bit from the podcast Revisionist History, for some of you have seen it. This is the record of an NBA team over the past few years between 2008 and 2016. You see the wins and losses. Look at that winning percentage. Great in, in 08 to 09, and then there's a fall off and then it got better. What happened during this time? Can anybody interpret the data we're seeing here? This was the departure and return of LeBron James from the Cleveland Cavaliers where a single man coming, uh, uh, leaving and then coming back could change the fortunes of an entire uh, professional basketball team. This is sort of how we think about healthcare. We look for the single ingredient. We look for the highest utilizer. We look for the single way we can actually improve health. Whereas in fact, I think a better analogy is this one. This is a, a shot taken from Sports Center last year of the women's soccer team uh, that played in the Olympics. And on the, the USA played Sweden in the semifinals. You can see there, look at that, number of shots on goal, USA 26, Sweden 3. Expected goals, 1.5, possession, passes, all that showed that the women's soccer team should have won and in fact they lost. Why is that? Because the nature of the game of soccer is different. You have to rescue the ball, you have to pass it up to your defender, you have to get it up to your midfield, you have to push it ahead. That's how you actually succeed in soccer. Many, many things have to go right, and health, that's how it is in these complex problems that we deal with. Many things have to go right. Children have to be born into the right families, they have to be raised by a loving family, they have to access to food and shelter. All those things have to happen. I think we need to start thinking about health broadly as more of a soccer problem than a LeBron James problem. This is how we should also focus on what are the problems that are worth solving. This is from the Global Burden of Disease um, done at Seattle with funding from the Gates Foundation. If you look at the right, these are the leading causes of death and disability in the United States. There's no surprise there, but heart disease, lung cancer, Alzheimer's disease, COPD. As a pediatric cardiologist, I worried, was I really working on these problems and spending my soul on large concerns? Could I do better? So I took a journey and I started to work uh, in policy at a much higher level at the federal U.S. government. There, the tools are very limited. The first was, let's measure performance and let's actually report that. I want to show you how that's more complicated than it sounds. Many of you know that Bill Clinton, uh, after he left the presidency, uh, had a heart attack uh, living in New York. What many people don't realize is that at that time, Surgeon-specific risk-adjusted cardiac mortality was being reported by the state of New York. This is difficult to see, but keep in mind here that you could actually go online and see the surgeon-specific risk-adjusted mortality. You probably want to go to the surgeon who had the lowest risk-adjusted mortality. President Clinton, if you look, there's a column that says RAMR, there's something there that has two asterisks on it, and there's one that has one. He went to the one with one asterisk. 
That is the only hospital that's an outlier and an outlier in the wrong direction. So, what this shows is even that the most sophisticated people among us, when they're presented with complex healthcare data, have a lot of difficulty making the right decision. This is, again, how we think about it. This is, playing, this is the LeBron James problem. We post complex information. We hope people will figure it out and do the best they can for themselves. Here's a better example of sort of how this could work. This is what Medicare did over the past few years, where they created a simple concept. This is just a few lines of code, so to speak, where if people who left the hospital then readmitted after 30 days, that hospital had to pay a penalty. Simple, simple measure, but that actually adds up to a lot of money. This is hacking healthcare, but it's regulatory hacking. And here, arguably, the writing of a few lines of regulatory code actually then resulted in a remarkable decrease in 30-day readmissions and the savings of several billion dollars. Can we scale these kinds of insights to address the soccer problems that we see that affect Americans? I want to give you an example uh, or a set of examples of how this can be done at scale. And this is work that I did at the federal government. Um, and then have continued uh, in my current role. This is um, the T system. I live in Boston, Massachusetts here. What we know is that your zip code determines your health in many, in profound ways, if you actually look at how, uh, where you live. This is the risk of type 2 diabetes. It turns out that with type 2 diabetes, we have known since the early 2000s that simply a program called the Diabetes Prevention Program, that's where it's a lifestyle modification program. Again, technology without wires. Look at the impact. Ten years after randomization, and this is a CDC randomized trial published in the New England Journal, people who had the initial intervention, just lifestyle, look at the cumulative incidence of diabetes. If that was a drug that would have been approved right away, we would have paid handsomely for it. And yet, instead, we continue to prescribe the uh, oral hypoglycemics, metformin and others, uh, cover those where we don't cover lifestyle. This is the, one of the problems we tried to solve. So it turned out that uh, at CMS, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, there was a special fund um, and a special award given to the YMCA to actually deploy the diabetes prevention program in community-based settings. Again, we want to scale it. If you want to scale it, you've got to get to where the people are at. They're where the YMCAs are. It turned out then that the YMCAs here um, demonstrated significant reduction in the total cost of care in a matched co cohort group. Now I want to get back to that regulatory hacking. It turned out that our team and others knew that deep within the Affordable Care Act, there's a section of that thousand page bill called Section 3021. Section 3021 said something very, very specific, which is that if money from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is used to fund an innovation and it r improves the cost of care and or the quality of care, you can generalize it across all of Medicare. In other, way, in other words, this is the way you can immediately scale. So our team took this. We certified that it actually uh, improved the health care of many beneficiaries, and this is at scale. This is millions and millions of people. However, we had another problem. It turned out that when the actuaries at CMS got a hold of the data, they ran it all, they said, look, we love what you did, but there's a problem. If you actually avoid getting diabetes, you live longer. If you live longer, you cost more. The CMS actuary cannot certify this as cost saving. How could you possibly handle that? And so I'll say the second regulatory innovation we had, again, hacking this healthcare, you could say to yourself, what would you do in that situation? It's actually very simple. We wrote um, a, a, a specific way of paying for these outcomes because the, uh, this is an outcomes-based payment. Again, you only get paid if you actually get weight loss. We created a strategy to do that. We work with the actuary and they said, sorry, that still is not gonna work. It's still um, going to cost us money because people live longer. And so the final hack we made was this one. Think about the 1,000-page Affordable Care Act, and this is a two-paragraph memo that we released at the time that we certified the DPP. And I'll just draw your attention to the last sentence. We came to the conclusion, we meaning a small group of us, said that, you know what, living longer? How are we going to get around that? You know what, that's just un-American. And so we added a sentence. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have made a determination that costs associated with expected improvements in longevity are not appropriate for consideration of per-program spending. 
That's how it is now. That law, that continues to exist now. And as a result of this, millions of people, the rule was just finalized last week, will have access to the diabetes prevention program. The second problem to fix is how is it that we can invest in healthcare where the benefits are not seen for many years? I call this the reality TV problem. These are the winners of American Idol in 2005-2006. Um, Carrie Underwood and Taylor Hicks. Carrie Underwood went on to become a multi-platinum recording artist. Taylor Hicks was dropped by his record label a year later. Why is that? Because if you're on American Idol, you're actually, it, what better way is there to tell who's going to succeed? It's like the ultimate shark tank, right? Well, it turns out this is the problem of surrogate endpoints, that when they're actually voting, the show doesn't really care about who's the most talented recording artist. They care about getting the most viewers. That is exactly how we think about healthcare. Think about ADHD meds. If you're on methylphenidate, the outcome variable that actually gets approval is, getting, is doing better on a, on a checklist that your pediatrician sees. But the outcome of interest is, does that child someday hold down a steady job, have meaningful relationships? That's what people care about. That's exactly how we've thought about healthcare for too long. So how do we address that problem through payment, specifically for heart attack and stroke? Turns out that you can actually, with fairly high degree of, of, of reliability, determine your 10-year risk of heart attack or stroke based on a simple risk profile. This is the American Heart Association risk calculator. What we did was simply decided, why don't we, instead of paying for your cholesterol level, your blood pressure, just calculate your 10-year risk, average that across for an entire provider panel, and then that provider has to control that entire population. And every percentage point that you lower that risk, by hook or by crook, you get some people to stop smoking, you get some people on cholesterol, this is patient-centered decision-making, the provider then makes money. So this is the world's first predictive analytic model at scale that's actually being paid for at scale. Um, there's a very simple way to think about payment for this, and now, it just launched earlier this year, this is the largest randomized trial of any preventive intervention ever done. 3.3 million Medicare beneficiaries are now being cluster randomized uh, to see whether this will actually prevent heart attack and stroke. So we heard about the diabetes prevention program, we heard about uh, cardiovascular disease. Again, this is innovation and hacking healthcare at scale using a regulatory framework. Smoking, the other leading cause of uh, ultimately cancer, COPD. How can we actually get people to really focus on stopping smoking? Yes, there are tools available, but how do we make sure the incentives line up? Very simple. What we did was rather than doing what, we, what the quality strategy was with people like Bill Clinton, which is surgeon adjusted mortality and put it up on a website that nobody visits, did something really different. We asked for every hospital to be given a score. That score would be the smoking rate in the county where the hospital is located as determined by the Centers for Disease Control. In other words, every hospital will be held accountable to some extent for the health of the community where they were based. Hospitals have to spend money on community benefit, but actually linking that to a meaningful population health metric suddenly could catalyze significant improvements. Because whenever you go to hospitals, you say, well, what could you do to really lower smoking rates here? What would they say? Probably the most effective strategy is a tobacco or cigarette per packet tax or, re or increasing the minimum age of smoking or purchasing tobacco to 21. Why would they never do that? Because the incentive wasn't there. It could now be there. This was signed off on uh, by endorsement for the National Quality Forum about a year and a half ago. Third, I'm sorry, fourth here. How do we address social determinants of health? Again, simple technology. Social determinants of health, if, as we've heard about earlier this week, housing, domestic violence, food security, how do we actually get people to pay attention to that at scale? How do we create the incentives? And the answer was very simple. We just have to measure it to start with. And you have to do it universally. And so this program is a $157 million pilot, again went live this year, called the Accountable Health Communities. This requires that all Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, this is millions of people, get screened for those social determinants of health. If they have a problem, they get referred to somebody who can help, and then all that data is being collected. And when you realize the local trends, there's a third infusion of capital to actually address the underlying problems, whether it's job training in certain areas, drug use, so to speak, you're free to sort of invest the dollars in whatever way you like. 
This is, again, how we can create change at scale with very simple changes in the incentive structures that are created. One of the last ideas we developed when I was at CMS was this concept of can we securitize public health? Again, using regulatory and financial innovation to actually make serious progress. We created three outcomes, cigarette smoking, adolescent pregnancy, and binge drinking. You can see that these are major problems, geographically diverse areas. And what we did was we proposed measuring the baseline in those geographies and then creating a, what's called the social impact bond, where if you lowered those risks by a certain percentage, after a certain period of time and that was certified, then you got paid for it. So what that did was essentially like saying that you have a buyer for this outcome if you can achieve it. And you can try to get there in any way you like. This is currently in clearance. What I'd like to spend the last few minutes talking about is the problem um, we've been working on for the last six months at Optum Labs, where I'm located. It's part of United Health Group. We are a large data analytics organization that has access to claims and clinical data. And probably after the federal government, um, UHG is the largest purchaser of healthcare services in the world. We know that the opioid crisis is now one of the leading causes of accidental death. We've heard about that a little bit here, where it's now surpassing the rate of uh, automobile accidents in young people. It turns out that even today, there is no framework for nationally telling where we, were, are, we are at with the opioid crisis. Although there are different measures that have been created, there is no agreed upon framework. And the things that get measured are the things that get changed. So very simply, again, this is technology without wires. This is simple stuff. Our team developed a full dashboard of two to four outcome measures in each of those areas and started to map them geographically and then think about, well, what could we do at scale? And I'll give you one example of that. We know, for example, that today about 45% of all opioid prescriptions that are written, and we just learned this uh, this year, are written not in compliance with CDC guidelines. The dose is too high, the duration is too long, and that matters. Turns out that every extra day of an opiate prescription you're given by your doctor actually increases your risk by one percentage point of becoming a chronic opioid user. Think about that. And it turns out that these same numbers probably apply to children as well, after dental surgery and so forth. So this is when you get a 30-day supply after having a minor toothache. We know that this varies a great deal based on geography and where you're at. But let me give one really specific example. This is North Carolina. Red means that they're, uh, as a state, they're not performing well on the first fill for their opioids. But what's the mechanism? It turns out that they actually do a good job with the dose. And this is us delving down into that data. The problem for them is in the duration of the supply. They have a tendency to write for scripts that are too long. So what could you do? Again, this is potentially affecting hundreds of thousands of people across the country. And so what was built in is a drug edit. So that if you go to the pharmacy and try to fill a first fill for longer than that period of time or higher than that dose, it automatically brings you back to that correct dose. And what's been the impact? This is data that we've just uh, gotten between July when the edits went live. In those areas, a 78% reduction in the first fill being outside of those guidelines. A 64% reduction in seven days. Now think about, we talk about 17 years for medical interventions to make an impact. This is within a few weeks. So this is the power of using simple regulatory approaches to address complex problems and in ways that actually can achieve scale, potentially improving the health of millions and millions of people. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Sarshak. So one of the things that's always uh, a challenge in healthcare is the misaligned incentives, yeah. including in the payer world, right? Yeah. Why should a large payer spend uh, even $1,000 preventing type 2 diabetes 10 or 20 years from now? <laughs> Especially in the US, it's misaligned. How can you realign those elements. Right, so I think that part of the heart, the biggest challenge there is that we pay for things all the time and require them to be paid for. Like medications are covered um, without really evidence that they get, really get cost saving. I think it's the same thing if we choose the right outcomes and we pay for those outcomes, that's sort of the way to get around it. As long as those outcomes then predict the long term.
benefit. Another misaligned incentive is often, you know, data feeds your amazing systems and a lot of the work here, but uh, individuals often are afraid to be data donors, particularly yeah. if some of the Obamacare uh, protections about pre-existing diseases occur. Yeah. How do we hack that? How do we get more folks to be open to sharing and getting back to sort of Google Maps yes. of, of healthcare? So I'd say two ways. The first is that to ensure, first of all, that those regulatory protections, protections don't go away. Assuming that we want to even take that extra step, this is where technology comes in. Can we appropriately de-identify that data? Perhaps have a, a two-person uh, need to then re-identify it in some way to actually make that happen. But I agree, donating data is critical to actually improving health. All right, so go make that happen. Thanks, Tarshak. Thank you. Thanks.